the Lamborghini Huracan. Can you believe it's been with us now since 2014? Yet in those seven years, until this week, I'd never even sat in one. But that hadn't really bothered me because the original Huracan, I just didn't like the looks of. It was just a, a little bit too plain for a Lambo. And as supercars go, especially Lamborghinis, if the looks don't wow you, then as far as I'm concerned, it's a bit of a failure. That all changed though with the release of the Huracan Performante and later the Evo. This is not the first time that a facelift has dramatically altered my perception of a car, but normally I have a hard time pinning down exactly what it is that they've changed, which has drawn me in so much. Yet with the Huracan, I can tell you exactly what it was. It's this rear end here, this little lift up spoiler at the back. Now this gives the car that added kick of aggression that it needed, and the original was desperately lacking. It, it just sort of tailed off into nothingness, and the whole rear end of the old Huracan was just, it looked a little high because the way they'd styled it and just, didn't really work. Now this is very, very busy, but it's got a real purpose to it. With those big perforated tailpipes sticking out the back, it looks mean. And I have to give Lamborghini some real kudos because unless you knew the model lineup intimately, there are no clues here to tell you this is the bottom one in the range. There's nothing obviously cheap about it. And this is technically the cheapest one, but um, when you're talking Lamborghinis, cheap is a very relative term. And this is where the Lamborghini's problems really begin. You see, under this very sharp Bianco Malide matte white exterior, you will find the exact same hybrid carbon fiber, aluminum chassis, and 5.2 liter naturally aspirated screaming V10, as was in the Audi R8 rear wheel drive that I had on loan last year. Now that car came with a list price of 117,000 pounds. This one is 240 grand. Now I would forgive you entirely if at this point you simply threw down your checkbook and walked away in disgust. That is a huge uplift in money for what on the face of it doesn't appear like a lot more. To give you an example, that engine here, sure, it makes a little bit more power. 600 horses versus the 540 in the R8 rear wheel drive but then you could buy a cheaper R8 with even more power than this. Torque is vaguely the same between all of them, just over 400 pound foot or about 560 newton meters. Sure, not very much if you're used to the modern turbocharged cars, but this responds then with a response and a soundtrack that a McLaren can only dream of. That really isn't still enough though, is it? Because even if you did buy the cheap R8, you're only a 500 pound remap away from making the same power as this. So the interior then, here's an area where the Huracan really frustrates. You see, the R8 has what I think is one of the best layouts of any car ever. It's beautifully elegant and simple and an absolute masterpiece of design because all you've got is one big virtual cockpit here and then a couple of HVAC dials over there. So the stuff you want a physical control for has a physical control and just about everything else is on the screen and you can manipulate all of the functions pretty easily from some very nicely located dials on the steering wheel. This totally the opposite. You have a big digital display here, which is nice, bright, clear, and pretty easy to read, but it doesn't actually do anything. It only changes how it looks if you put the car into Corsa mode, which is not something you ever want to do on the road. And pretty much every other function is on a touch screen down here. And I, I really mean that. You wanna turn up the stereo, you have to take your eyes completely off the road, press a button, and then slide something along. Change radio station, same thing. Change the temperature of the cabin, same thing. Stop the aircon blowing, same thing. It is massively infuriating. Even this little toggle switch here to start stop the car that people talk about as if it's the best thing ever, I think it's just an awful gimmick really. You can see the start stop button. So and honestly, half the time I just put my finger straight through it and press it, but it, 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 it's just a bit naff. Now, I do like the little lever here for reverse. Very responsive, car puts into reverse straight away, and this car will creep, which is not something many supercars do. It's much nicer to be able to move this around in a car park off the brakes, rather than what Ferrari and others expected to do, which is move a 700 horsepower car on the accelerator. That can be a little bit scary. However, frustratingly, the park button, which you usually have to press yourself because the car doesn't really want to put itself in park, is stuck under here, so that's very tough to get to. The window switches, which are on this little sort of bevy of toggles up here, go the opposite way to how you would think. And perhaps most criminal of all, the materials in here all feel and look 
rather Audi. This stuff here, this is straight out of every Audi I've ever driven. Put your hands here and here and here and here and here and it just doesn't feel that luxurious. Now my Gallardo as an example is a car which very clearly had some pretty old out-of-date Audi switches in but the supercar tradition has always been to buy in cheap plastic bits from anywhere you could find them and then cover them in the most amazing luxurious leather and they've just not done that here. These air vents they're just plain plastic. Yes you can have them made in forged composite but I hate the look of that stuff and it's um well, shouldn't, shouldn't they just be leather covered? Everything in here should be nice to the touch. It should be a car you just get in and go, oh my goodness, this is glorious. These seats as well, by the way, they, they look amazing, but um, Lamborghini have continued one of their traditions. Many other supercar companies will partner with someone like Recaro or Sparco or Cobra for their seats. But Lamborghini instead seem to have partnered with the CIA because after about seven or eight hours in one of these, which I have done, you will tell anyone anything to get out of this car. It's it's pretty bad. And there are some nice touches. For example, the system for indicating here is pretty nice. If you've ridden a motorbike, it's going to be fairly familiar to you and it makes a lot more sense than the one that Ferrari use. Another thing I don't like is the blank switches here, which presumably are for cruise control, still an option. Even on a car with a base price of nearly £175,000, cruise control, not one of the things that you get thrown in. These switches down here have a real nice feel about them, and indeed everything in here has been put together really very well. Nothing creaks or rattles or anything, it's all very solid, but it's also all very German, and that's just disappointing. A Lamborghini interior should be genuinely opulent, and this just isn't. Now look, I know, I know, I keep going on about interior materials in nearly every video, but that's because it's really important. And when we're looking at something which costs twice as much as something that has many of the same parts, that's gotta be one of the areas where this really differentiates itself. I personally think VAG really need to take a look at their different brands and, and make it a little bit more room. After all, I think we can all agree that a Porsche should always feel a bit nicer than an Audi, in the same way that an Audi should feel a bit nicer than a Skoda. And by the same token, a Lamborghini should feel a lot nicer, a lot more high-end than a Porsche, and yet this just doesn't. And I am extremely grateful to Lamborghini UK for lending me this car, particularly as they've given it to me for a week, which is very unusual in terms of supercar loans, and they've allowed me to bring it all the way up to sunny well, all the way up to Scotland, anyway. This car being the rear-wheel drive too, you might think, if you were a Porsche fan, that would give you a little bit of extra room up the front, making it ideal for this kind of journey. But I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to disappoint you there because luggage space in this car is a bit of a joke. It is something Lamborghini, I think, really need to fix because actually, seats aside, you can do big miles in this car. It's not even that bad on fuel. I averaged about 24 to the gallon on the way up thanks to cylinder deactivation and just, well, sitting at 70 mile an hour. Now, let's talk a little bit again about that price. Yes, this is 240,000 pounds up from a base price of 173 on the road. I recently visited Lamborghini Pangborn and I gave them a call when I was getting this press car to do a little bit of real world research. I spoke to Craig, who's the sales manager over there, and he's absolutely excellent. In fact, the whole team are really friendly. If ever I were to go and buy myself a new Lamborghini, they'd be the only people I'd want to speak to. And they told me that in the real world, most Huracan Evo rear wheel drive coupes are going out the door at about 190 to 200,000 pounds, which is kind of what I'd expect. And in fact, most of the options on this car are actually quite quite reasonably priced. They have a driver and lifestyle pack, which has a lot of things in it for not a lot of money. To give you an idea, it has front and rear parking sensors, very much needed, lift, absolutely essential. Do not go anywhere near one of these without front lift. It also gives you the carbon ceramic brakes, which are not standard. Gives you the clear glass tailgate at the back so you can see the engine. It gives you mag ride, also not standard and very much desirable. And a couple of little bits as well. That whole lot is only 5,000 pounds. So how on earth did this get to 240? Well, I shall tell you because this paintwork, £11,000 plus fat, and I really, really don't like it. Give me a Lambo in green, give me a Lambo in yellow, give me a Lambo in purple, give me a Lambo in anything, but please not white, definitely not matte white, but, but it's a press car, it's not mine. 
there was on the spec sheet this little little single item that said ad personum 18,000 pounds plus VAT that's 20 percent here in the UK and I know what ad personum is ad personum is Lamborghini's individual department their exclusive division you can do all sorts of funky stuff uh, with them so I emailed my contact at Lamborghini and I said to her, what's, what's this 18 grand? I would have thought maybe it'd be the paint because I have had press cars with 18,000 pound paint jobs before, but the paint was already listed separately. And she said, uh, oh, it's the stripe. Now it's hand painted and it's very nice little Italian tricolor, but um, there's only about six foot of it. It's um, 21 and a half thousand pounds for a stripe even by Lamborghini standards I think that's a bit too much and that's a real shame because the rest of the options list aside from the fact there are things on it which shouldn't be optional but then the universal rule of course is the more expensive the car the less you'll be given so cruise control that sort of stuff should be standard you can add wheels and things to the car but honestly please 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 have the 19s these are rubber bands on these 20s and I, I don't really like the look they're, they're too busy they're, they're too fussy um, and also black wheels on white car is a nightmare for photographic purposes um but yeah, there are lots and lots of things you can add to this car, but you don't really need to spend much more than 200 grand. If you want a Spider, that's about another 16K. And this is very important to know because this car at 200,000 pounds, you're gonna view very differently to this car at 240. But even at the bargain price of 200,000 pounds, the Huracan faces some very stiff competition. Internally, you've got the newly released 992 Turbo S offering that evergreen 911 appeal, not quite a supercar granted, but then you could spend 160,000 pounds on an R8 and you'll get the all wheel drive system this car is missing and you'll have a slightly more powerful version of the same engine mated to the same chassis with a less frustrating interior. The new McLaren Artura is about to land too and I'm sure like every McLaren it's going to be unreasonably fast and very good to drive. The Honda NSX still exists if you remember it and provides you with an alternate take on the supercar formula. It's more or less an SF90 Stradale for a lot less money. Then of course there is the daddy. You could go and get a Ferrari F8 Tributo which will give you a very appealing car with a lot more practicality and space and even more power from its twin turbocharged V8. And at £240,000, the price of this, you could get yourself an F8 with quite a nice spec too. This being 2021, it's not good enough anymore for a car simply to be very fast. And I can tell you now, this is very fast. What this car needs to be to have any hope of justifying its existence is fun. So is it. Having now spent about 750 miles at the wheel of this car, I do feel rather qualified to answer. And I can tell you that around town, at low speeds, or just pottering around, this is absolutely miserable. There are a whole host of sometimes baffling things about this car that I, I truly fail to understand. They include the fact that unlike many other supercars, when you start off, it goes straight into auto mode. But to put it into manual, your shift mode you have to press the little M button down here worryingly close to what you have to do in the current 911 and that does give me a little bit of a hint that VAG are again trying to homogenize their products just a little more than I'm comfortable with and if you do happen to leave the car in auto mode there is what I consider to be a nearly fatal flaw allow me to demonstrate let's just say you're around town doing 30 mile an hour or so like we are now and the car will shuffle straight to seventh as quickly as it can you come to your national speed limit at the end of town and you put your foot all the way down this is my foot flat my foot all the way to the floor but not the kick down button in the car so there's I would say about five or six seconds until it gets to 2000 rpm and then it starts to move you need to put your foot onto the kick down button in auto mode to get it to do anything but when you do that it'll shift all the way down to third if you were in sport mode and you tried to do the same thing the car would shift without even needing to press kick down from seventh to second and if you're not expecting it that will produce a rather dramatic burst of acceleration it's all a bit odd really almost as if Lamborghini didn't care at all what the car's like in auto mode 
When you are in manual though, as I'm going to be for the remainder of this review, the gearbox is excellent. I mean, truly superb. It shifts smoothly enough in Strada, and when you're in sport, as we'll see later, it is almost supernaturally quick. Another thing notable by its absence is an individual mode. There are no ways to configure your personal settings for this car, and there's a lot that changes between the three different driving modes, Strada, Sport and Corsa. The exhaust note changes, the throttle response changes, the weight of the steering changes, the suspension changes, all sorts of stuff. But you can only have one of the three pre-configured settings that Lamborghini give you, and that is very, very irksome indeed, because quite often I'll want to have quite a nice drive, but I don't want to disturb everyone around me, so I wish I could make the exhaust quiet, and that's fine, put it in strata mode. But I really prefer, when I'm on it, the sporty steering feel, but you can't have that without making lots and lots of noise. And what do I mean by lots and lots of noise? Well, um, this is strata. This is sport. I didn't know cars could sound like this anymore. I thought they'd been consigned to the history books. Now, I'm not saying that Lamborghini didn't get the memo three years ago saying all their cars needed to be quiet and fitted with petrol particulate filters. They probably did get it, but I'm not convinced that they opened it. In fact, if I were a betting man, I'd say that ever since they got that letter from the EU, that table in the canteen hasn't wobbled since. I do love Lambo. The Urus does have a particulate filter in it, but none of the rest of the range has, which means they're probably using Urus as a way of balancing things out. It's their gesture of goodwill. On a nice, smooth, flowing road like this with reasonably decent tarmac, the car's okay, the suspension is compliant enough, but on anything less than a perfect road, it's really, really quite uncomfortable. It jars you around and these seats are a bit of a misery. They feel like lumbar support has been permanently inflated. And if you make the criminal mistake like I did of trying to use this car across long distances, you'll find that with these sporty seats, there's no quick way of being able to get into the back either. There's some storage space, like a little shelf behind the seats, and that's pretty much half of your storage space. But um, you, you, you can't get to it. The process to get in there is quite a laborious one. That is something of an oversight. You really would have thought that you, you should be able to get to that without any hassle at all. Add to that the frustration of the aforementioned nav system, and perhaps my favourite bit of all, the knee pad down here. A lot of cars have a little soft knee pad, particularly sporty ones. It's very helpful when you're driving hard. But the one in the Lamborghini is a rock-hard Alcantara-covered triangle. It's about as comfortable and supportive as nearly on a Toblerone. I just don't get who said, yeah, we need a bit of knee support here, lads. Um, yeah, I know what. Let's just put this wooden brick there. That'll do just fine. Uh, d d why? 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 Visibility, not really a Lamborghini strong point, but were you expecting anything different? That I'm certainly not going to deduct points for. What you can see, though, if you look ahead, is a reflection of the air vent in the middle of the dash, and that's rather frustrating. Behind you, you can see next to nothing. In fact, I believe if you go for the regular specification of car, which has louvers on the back, not only does it look at least 10 times cooler, but you can actually see more as well. So why you'd go for the glass cover, I don't know. I mean, I know some people like that sort of thing, but to me, I think louvers are just that much better. It certainly works well enough, beyond a mild panic when I thought that I broke it because of it not accelerating out of town, it's actually behaved itself reasonably well. The lift function I have had to use quite a few times because if you're going across anything other than pretty good tarmac, if you go through a dip, 
you're going to hit the bottom of the car. It, it's just an inevitability. It's like Thanos, it's just going to happen. As you can probably tell, I wasn't really enjoying an awful lot about this car. After seven or eight hundred miles, I really was pondering, giving Lamborghini a call and asking them if they'd mind just coming and getting it and taking it back because I wasn't really sure of any reason why you'd possibly want one of these over a Ferrari F8. Yes, the F8 is a little bit more money, but I also got some finance quotes from Ferrari and Lamborghini, and if you are going to go the finance route, which many people do, the Ferrari, even at a higher list price, actually isn't any more expensive to buy. The car does have one redeeming feature because once you're done with it being absolutely awful at just about everything and you finally at long last after seven or eight hundred miles you manage to get it onto the right road at the right time you find out this car is quite special I've never known anything snatch victory from the jaws of defeat quite like this Huracan. I was absolutely convinced that anybody spending money on one of these over and above an R8 had to be absolutely bananas. I had the R8 for three weeks last year and it's a flawed car too, but I really did enjoy my time with it. I'd read in so many different reviews how the Huracan was supposed to be so much better, so much more fun, this, that and the other, and I just thought, how can that possibly be true? They're the same car. Yet from where I'm sat now, I don't really feel it at all. The big difference is in the steering. Now it's not perfect. It's still shy, say, of a Ferrari F8 and a long way shy of a McLaren 570S. But unlike the R8, it has a real sense of involvement. There's no feedback, there's no texture from it. It doesn't really respond. I can't feel the grain of the road as I go across it like you would in a Lotus, but it's very quick, not unsettlingly so, like you'd find in many a Ferrari. It whitens up perfectly, particularly in sport mode, and it's always, always the right speed. Lamborghini have been working on their dynamic steering system for quite some time. In the early days, I know it was something particularly in the first Huracan that was much maligned, but they've kept at it and over time they have refined it to a point now where I would actually legitimately order a car with dynamic steering and I, I just, I could never ever think of myself doing that, just absolutely not, would never happen. But it's decent, really properly decent. Engine response, as you might expect, absolutely sensational. It's always got, once you're above 2000 RPM, plenty of punch. Gearbox, absolutely superb. And once you do get it moving, the suspension really starts to make sense too. Particularly in strata mode, actually, it actually becomes quite compliant. It, it really does start to work. There you go, the side of the road here is quite uneven, as you can probably tell, but the car takes it in its stride. It just really comes alive. This is what I hope my Gallardo would always do, but it sadly never did. I can't think how, but ever since I started driving the car quicker, it doesn't seem to be quite as economical as it was before. There are also other minor frustrations that you do notice, like for example, in both Strada and Sport mode, if you hit the red line, the car will change up for you. In Strada mode, I can just about forgive it. I, I don't like it, but I can just about forgive it. In Sport mode, in a Lamborghini, the idea of a car changing up for you at the red line, just, just what? Why? Why would you do that? That's absolutely maddening. It's like it doesn't trust me, and I don't like that at all. In terms of trust, this car, compared with, say, a Ferrari or a McLaren, is very light on any sort of traction control modes. You've got several, but again, they're all linked to your selection switch down here, which means that when you're in sport, you get sport traction. When you're in course, you get course traction. 
and when it's damp, even sport mode does let the car wriggle around quite a bit, and you get some odd sensations through the chassis too. Like it will, it will wiggle like like quite a bit. Like you, you put your foot down, and, and the whole thing just kind of shimmies a touch and goes through, and it feels like the whole thing's twisting. I know it's not. This is a really rigid platform. It's actually an excellent thing. This whole section here behind us is pretty much all carbon, as is part of the the central sort of well, you call it transmission tunnel, but it's not. And down here, the rest of it's a aluminium panels. So why it does that, I'm, I'm really not so sure. There is something with cars like this that I think a lot of people, YouTubers in particular, journos especially, are very rarely going to admit. And that's the fact that the speed is more or less irrelevant. I went out the other day and had one of those drives. I was trying to get some footage shot of this car making a little bit of noise on a road I know quite well and a friend was there at the same time in his new GR Yaris. Now he knows the road and I only sort of just about know the road. He was catching me quite happily and I was not going slow in this car. So this in practice is no quicker than a Toyota GR Yaris and it's £200,000 more but that's okay. I'm not worried about that. You were never going to get £200,000 more speed out of this. Just simply not going to happen. It might feel like it, but in the real world, A to B, you're just not going to go that much quicker. The things that will hold you back are how much you care about your license and how well you know the road. That's it, simple as. But this thing is drama. I mean, this is real, pure, simple, unadulterated theater. And people love it for that. I mean, it really is properly special. From that impossibly low nose that just disappears in front of you to the way it looks when it goes down the road. I mean, I've rarely enjoyed filming drive-bys quite as much as I have with this car. Although we have to be careful because when you're in sport mode and it starts cracking and popping, it does scare a lot of sheep. And that's illegal up here. Once you get into a groove with it, it flows really quite sensationally well. It never really talks back to you, it never communicates, and I never have the faith in it that I did with, say, the F8 to really push on and explore its limits. When it's got a little bit sideways on me, as it has a couple of times because the weather's been a bit mixed here, I don't trust it enough to really start pushing on. That's my sign where I start backing off, but that's okay. When it's dry, this thing has absolutely huge reserves of grip, really quite fabulous. I genuinely can't think why you'd want an all-wheel drive one of these. It's about another £30,000 or so, and you don't really get that much more for it. You get a couple of extras thrown in a standard, but nowhere near enough to make up the price difference. Yeah, you get a little bit more power, but again, not enough to make up the difference, and I'm sure if you want, you can probably remap this. People do really seem to love the Lamborghini. They even love the white paint. Not sure they would if I told them how much it and its stripe cost, but they do like it, and, and that's kind of important. I'm always worried about how people will look at these kind of things, supercars in particular. They're very vulgar items, especially something as flashy and as loud and as showy as this, but no, everyone really goes for it. I've got a lot of thumbs up on this trip, and, and I appreciate that because it makes the back pain just that, that little bit more tolerable. Like a lot of these cars, you do have to be constantly aware of just how quick it can go in not very much time at all. You just put your foot down for a few seconds and you're easily doing triple digits. That's not a hard thing to do whatsoever. It's this kind of section here. This is the stuff that does worry me in this car because that front end is just bouncing up and down. You're waiting for it to tap. And every time you go into a bend like this, you go, <gasps> you know, oh, it didn't. But then the next one you go, oh, will it do it on this one? No. Nearly got air there. This road really is kind of born for this car. It's got such reserves of power. The uh, gearbox is so much fun. Strada really is the, the best mode for this thing. And I wish you just had an exhaust button and a suspension button. 
that would make life so much better. It's all the personalization you need. Oh, crikey. <laughs> the ceramics, I don't like them. There we go. There's the bottom of the car. Yeah, the brakes. There's the bottom of the car again. Do not like these brakes. They're exactly the same, I'm quite certain, as on the R8 Performance that I had last year. And like that car, when you're really on it, they're okay. But when you're not, you'll just be driving along, yada, 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 mind your business. You're like, oh, there's a bird there. And um, even if you weren't trying to slow for kamikaze poultry, you can wind up accidentally putting you and your passenger through the front screen. But as we've slowed down, we may as well speed up again. It changed up for me. I don't like that. Now I would put this into Corsa mode to fix that, but then it becomes really quite stiff and I just, I don't need that, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that the cracks and pops are very clearly engineered in because you get your, you know, exactly uniform, four or five cracks and pops exactly at the same time. It's like a Golf R, you know, there you are, no more, no less, you know. That'd be silly, Look, listen to it, you know, you just go, whoa, there they are, here we go. It's the same ones. It's the same cracks and pops over and over again. There's nothing natural about those at all. It's silly. You can set your watch by them if you needed to. It's stupid. It's stupid. It's unnecessary. It's not needed. Lamborghinis shouldn't need to add any kind of drama or flair. They should just be drama and flair. They should just be excitement. And this, at the right time, on the right road, really is. And it's taken me some time to work out how you could possibly ever justify a car like this. And there are only very, very few scenarios where you can. First off, you need to want a Lamborghini. And you need to want a Lamborghini specifically because honestly, if you've got this amount of money to spend, buy a Ferrari or buy a McLaren. Or if you want to be boring, buy a 911. Done. But if you do want a Lamborghini, this is not a bad thing. If you want that V10 experience, and that's all you care about, go and get the R8. It's gonna be much better for less money. To me, the way that this car would make sense is if you order the Spider version. See, the Spider is even less practical than this because you lose some of your, your very limited already rear storage space. And the Spider doesn't even look that great because it's got a fabric roof and this is just almost inexcusable. Nobody else has got a fabric roof anymore, you know? Why, why would you do that? Like Ferrari's got a folding hardtop, McLaren's got a folding hardtop, just sort it out. But it doesn't matter because you're going to have that down all the time. It doesn't matter that the car's a little bit heavier because it was already established. This is only as fast as a GR Yaris being driven by someone who knows the road better than you anyway. But if you have the Spider, 16,000 pounds more, you're going to get more of that noise, even when you're not making quite as much of it. You're going to get the wind in your hair. You're going to get that sensation of speed, even at lower speeds. You're going to get more drama, which means you get more Lamborghini. And then you're going to take the car out only really when you can have the roof down, only really when it's sunny. And that means you're going to take it out only when you're really, really going to appreciate it. Because if you drive this car every single day, like I do, you're going to find plenty of time to discover all of its faults and it has loads of them, a laundry list of them and they're so frustrating because so many of them, like the lack of individual mode and stuff like that, would just so easily be fixed but Lamborghini, whether it's arrogance, whether it's indifference, I just simply couldn't say but they just can't be bothered to sort lots of these things but they did at the very least make sure that on the right road at the right time I know a lot of people say a Lamborghini isn't really a car for drivers but this this is in fact I would say to some extent this is a car exclusively for drivers who want a Lamborghini because if you're a poser I'm not sure you'd enjoy it really that much at all so there we go that is my take, oh, there's the bottom of the car, on the Lamborghini Huracan Evo rear-wheel drive coupe. Fast, flawed, and at the right time, at the right moment, very fun. So I suppose that makes it a proper Lamborghini. 
Thanks for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.